Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Brain Tumor Foundation for inviting me to uh, speak at this event. Uh, today I'd like to uh, talk to you about benign skull-based tumors, and I'd like to review three uh, types of skull-based tumors and give you an overview of uh, what these tumors are and um, what, how they affect uh, patients in their daily life. So the objectives of my talk is to gain an appreciation of the variety of skull-based tumors, the common symptoms and signs that show up, uh, and uh, to understand that uh, these tumors, because of their location, uh, although they're called uh, benign, they can have uh, important effects in patient quality of life, um, and uh, their clinical course may not necessarily be benign. Uh, and finally, uh, to appreciate uh, the need for further research uh, in these tumors and how they impact uh, patients. So this is the skull base. The skull base is uh, what it sounds. It's basically the lower part of our cranium or our, our skull. And the important thing about the skull base is that it has all these holes. So you can see here, as it turns around, the holes in the bottom of that skull. And those holes are where important cranial nerves um, and other neurological structures like the brain, uh, like the brain stem connect with the rest of the body. Um, so in that big hole, the foramen magnum is where the bottom of the brain stem connects with the spinal cord. And then the other holes are where other cranial nerves come out. As uh, uh, Kelly showed before, the cranial nerves arise from the brain stem and then they come out, and they come out through these foramina or holes in the skull. The other part, important part of the skull base is that it's very near the eye structures and it's very near um, the uh, seat of the skull, which is where the pituitary gland sits. And the pituitary gland is the master control gland for hormones in our body, which I'll talk to a little bit later. So the tumors in the skull uh, base come from a number of different structures. They come from the bone. Um, so they can be primary tumors that arise uh, from the, the actual bone itself or bone cells. So they can come from the lining of the brain called the dura, which is kind of the sac in which the, the brain itself sits. They can come from the nerve roots that are going out through the foramina or the holes in the skull. And they can come from the pituitary gland that sits right at the base of the skull in a structure called the cella or the seat of the skull. They can come from other structures very close to the uh, skull base, like the mucosa or the lining of the nasal passages uh, and the eye structures. And finally, they can spread from other parts of the body where you can have what, what are called metastatic tumors to the skull base. This is a picture of the the bottom of the skull. Okay, so and what we normally do is we separate um, the skull base into four different compartments, the anterior skull base, um, the cella, which is the middle part of the skull, and then the middle portion of the skull base, uh, and then the posterior skull base, or posterior fossa. The reason we do this is that there are particular tumors that are more common in a certain location in the skull base. So for the anterior skull base, um, you find tumors that arise uh, from the nerves that allow us to smell, so our factory neuroblastomas, um, tumors that arise from the mucosa, like paranasal sinus uh, cancer, and meningiomas, those are the tumors that arise from the dura, or that thick leathery lining of the brain. In the cella, we see tumors that are called uh, craniopharyngioma that uh, are often present in children, as well as pituitary adenomas that are very frequent in, in adults. Um, we also see meningiomas in this uh, general uh, vicinity. Finally, in the posterior fossa, we see uh, tumors related to the uh, eighth uh, cranial nerve, the acoustic uh, neuromas. Uh, the other name for that is acoustic schwannoma. Uh, we see chondrosarcomas, uh, chordomas, uh, epidermoid tumors, and meningiomas. And as you can see, meningiomas kind of can happen anywhere in the skull base. So the, the way we organize the, the types of tumors, it also helps us remember what types of signs and symptoms these tumors present with. Uh, 
So patients with anterior cranial fossa tumors present uh, with headaches. They can have nasal symptoms, and the nasal symptoms can include discharge, um, fluid coming from the nose, uh, bleeding, recurrent bleeding from the nose or nosebleeds, a uh, sense of fullness or pressure in the sinuses. Um, so some, some of these patients may have uh, symptoms of uh, chronic sinus problems for a long time and uh, they may be treated for sinus infections or repeated sinus infections but uh, eventually they, we, we find that they, these are all symptoms related to a tumor. They may have hot sinus obstruction as, as well. Uh, patients may present with the loss of the sense of smell, so I talked about that olfactory neuroblastoma. Um, they may present with decline in vision if the tumor is very extensive and involving the uh, optic uh, pathways, the optic nerves, or invading the eye sockets. Uh, and finally, if these tumors are quite large, they press on the front parts of the brain called the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are very important for our personality and our thinking processes. And so you may have uh, slowing of uh, your thought processes, changes in your memory, or changes in personality. Middle cranial fossa tumors, so tumors in the middle, in the mid part of the skull base, pre may present with headaches. They may present with facial pain or numbness um, because the facial nerve goes out those neuroforamina at that level in the middle part. Um, you may have double vision, seeing two objects right beside each other or on top of each other. Uh, hearing loss, uh, a decline in vision again because it's, uh, the visual structures go through that middle part of the cranial fossa, and seizures. The uh, tumors in the cella region are a special um, uh, breed, if I may say, they uh, usually present with a visual field uh, deficit. So when we talk about visual fields, think about what we see in our environment in front of us and think of it as a, as a sphere or a circle. And what patients with pituitary adenomas present with is a cut in that field or loss of their peripheral uh, vision. They may also have a decline in their visual acuity uh, and that's usually the symptom of that is just blurring of the vision or having to change prescription uh, glasses more frequently, um, having more difficulty reading uh, words on a page. Uh, these patients may also have symptoms of hormone dysfunction or hormone excess, and we'll, I'll talk about those a little bit later. Finally, uh, patients with posterior cranial fossa tumors may have a whole host of symptoms and signs, and that's related to the fact that, as Kelly alluded to earlier, that you have the brain stem in that posterior fossa part of the brain. And so patients may have ringing in the ear, hearing loss, facial pain or numbness, facial muscle weakness, double vision, hoarseness in their voice, difficulty swallowing, balance difficulties, um, headaches or upper neck pain because it's at the back of the skull. Um, nausea or vomiting uh, because it's affecting the cerebellum uh, and then um, the spinning sensation of what we call vertigo. Um, they are, patients, if the tumors are large enough, they're pressing on the brainstem, they can produce limb weakness or incoordination. And these tumors uh, are often delayed in diagnosis and we see this uh, time and time again and it's, it's not a fault of the general practitioners or um, you know, uh, bad uh, medical care. It's really because of the nature of the tumors. Um, they are slow growing tumors. Um, and uh, the symptom onset is often gradual, it's often subtle. And so it may take years for a particular symptom to develop or cause significant concern that a patient will walk into their family doctor and complain about it. Um, you know, uh, one of the symptoms for acoustic uh, neuroma, which is one of these posterior fossa tumors, is um, gradual uh, decline in your ability to recognize uh, speech or to understand speech. So sometimes patients will say, well, doc, you know, I've always picked up the phone on the right side, and in the last few months, I just haven't been able to make out what my, what my mom is saying on the phone when I pick up the phone, right? And, and it's really these subtle symptoms that we have to keep a keen ear for. Um, symptoms may be mistaken for other types of conditions. So headache is one of the most common concerns that family doctors deal with in the community. And the origin of headache may be um, 
quite uh, diverse. So you may have migraine headaches, you may have headaches because of stress, uh, tension type headaches. Um, but trying to define the headaches related to skull-based tumors can be quite difficult. You may have present with unusual symptoms that um, your family doctor may not be familiar with, like double vision, visual impairment, facial weakness, um, hormone dysfunction, and some of the hormone uh, dysfunction or excess uh, syndromes um, are quite rare, and the you know the general practitioner may not have familiarity with. Um, and finally, these are rare tumors, so it's not something that it's at the top of their differential list. So this is the incidence of uh, three of the tumors that I'm going to be speaking to today. Um, I won't be speaking about vestibular schwannoma, which is another very common type of tumor, but I'm happy to answer any questions if, that you may have at, at the end about vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas. It's the same, same name for the same tumor, two names for the same tumor. Um, I'll, I will speak about pituitary adenoma. So these happen in 80 to 150 uh, per million. Um, so it's quite frequent. Uh, in Calgary, we treat about 50 of these patients a year surgically. Uh, and we are trying to get the word out about the signs and symptoms to recognize uh, these patients uh, because we think we're probably missing about half of the patients um, in Calgary that, that um, would require treatment or um, follow up for their tumors. Uh, secondly, meningiomas. This is probably one of the most common types of uh, benign brain tumors. Um, it uh, happens more frequently in females, so you can see the difference in, in terms of the incidence. Uh, so 20 to 70 per million per year. Uh, so in Calgary, we would see about 30 uh, a year of these uh, tumors. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about a rare tumor um, uh, called chordoma. And this is a, a very rare tumor, but it's a tumor that I've, I've done some work on in terms of looking at quality of life in these, in these patients. So pituitary adenoma, uh, as I mentioned, typically presents with a visual disturbance, either a change in the vision acuity, so a blurred vision, or a loss of the vi peripheral vision. And uh, the signs and symptoms are um, uh, also can be related to hormone dysfunction or hormone right. excess. The reason that it causes vision disturbance is that it presses on the optic chiasm. It's kind of the crossroads of our optic structures. Um, so from the optic nerves, they cross over and then they go to the back parts of the brain and the occipital lobe. And what the tumor does is it interferes with that, that signal by pressing on the middle part of that crossover there, which is uh, shown here. So the tumor kind of sits sits in the... Um, so you oh. It won't uh, light up because it's too light, the background's too light, but you see that uh, reddish tumor there in, in the skull, and it's pressing up on the optic structures, and that's, that's what happens. These tum tumors grow upwards and press on the opti optic structures. When we talk about hormone uh, problems, we can think about hormone excess or hom hormone dysfunction or lack of production. So when you have too much um, hormone, you can get two different types of uh, syndromes that are uh, the most common in, in this scenario. One's called Cushing's disease and the other called, is called acromegaly. Cushing's disease is when, when you have excess uh, cortisol production. The cortisol is produced in a gland uh, called the adrenal gland. And the production of the cortisol is signaled by the pituitary gland. Um, and it's a very coordinated process. And so when you have a pituitary tumor that's producing high signal to produce cortisol, you, you get Cushing's disease. And I'll show you on the next slide what that, what that means. Also, when you have excess growth hormone, you get what's called acromegaly, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. For hormone dysfunction, um, these symptoms can be quite subtle. You can have spontaneous production of breast milk in males or females, um, low energy, uh, low libido, uh, sensitivity to hot or cold, changes in your skin, in your hair, um, uh, changes in your mood. Um, so they can be quite subtle um, and they're often diagnosed by blood work um, or testing the hormone levels. In patients with Cushing's disease, they, they develop uh, obesity, um, changes in the fat distribution, so you get fat uh, accumulating in, in the back. Um, you get thinning and loss of uh, muscle. 
uh, thinning of the skin, so you easily uh, bruise, you're easily susceptible to infections, um, and you get reddening and kind of rounding of the face. And these are all very similar symptoms that we see with, um, on, with in patients who are on dexamethasone because dexamethasone is this type of steroid. And this is just the endogenous steroid that's produced by, uh, by the body. Um, so uh, the, one of the important medical aspects of this is that uh, patients that have uncontrolled Cushing's disease are at very high risk of uh, having cardiac um, problems, so uh, heart attack and stroke, uh, and then complications from diabetes or high blood sugar. Patients with acromegaly uh, present with coarsening of their facial uh, features or uh, increase in the size of their hands or their feet. Um, and this may be, this may occur very slowly over a period of years and cause changes in um, the, patient, the patient's appearance. Um, and often um, it takes quite a long time for these patients to be identified uh, because they, they themselves don't see the, the changes, but family members may see the changes. If they haven't seen someone for a long time, they may comment on that. And this, here's just a picture of a, um, this is a, a gentleman who was treated uh, by Harvey Cushing. He was one of the well-known neurosurgeons who actually developed the field of pituitary surgery. And uh, this is a picture of him 10 years before on the left side, and then the picture at the time of diagnosis, and you can see how his facial features are just broader and coarser, um, and uh, broad nose, broad cheeks, and this is just related to the growth hormone causing thickening of the bone and growth of uh, the bony uh, structures. His hands were also larger, his feet were larger. Um, so for pituitary adenoma, the, the treatment really depends on the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is made um, by MRI imaging to, to look at whether there's, there's a growth in the pituitary gland, and secondly, by doing blood work for hormone levels. Uh, and that combination of those two things usually gives us a sense of what type of tumor uh, is, uh, is uh, growing. Um, whether it's secreting growth hormone, or cortisol, or another type of uh, hormone. And usually the diagnosis is made in a team uh, with the endocrinologist. Uh, and then if the tumors are large enough that they're causing neurological deficits or they require um, histological diagnosis, a piece of the tumor to be sent to the pathologist to confirm the diagnosis, then the neurosurgeon would uh, get involved. There is medication available for certain types of these tumors, and that depends again on the on the diagnosis. And the role for surgery is for large tumors that are pressing on the optic structures, or for tumors um, where we don't have a, a clear diagnosis. For those tumors that are uh, hormone overproducing, where there's no medication available to treat those tumors, we also get involved um, to resect uh, these tumors. So, how do we get to the base of the skull? Well, um, in the past, we used to use the microscope, and we would go and make an incision right under the lip and uh, go to open up a pathway to the base of the skull uh, through the nose. But nowadays, we have what's called the endoscope, which is a rod that has a lens at the, at the tip and a light that allows us to look deep into very narrow structures so that we can actually go through the nostrils and go up in the back of the nose and all the way to the base of the skull. And using small drills, we're able to take down the bone that's in front of the um, pituitary gland and get to the tumor that way. And this has really revolutionized the treatment uh, for pituitary tumors because patients come in, um, they can have the procedure and they can be out of hospital within a couple of days um, if there's no complications related to, to the procedure. Um, and that's that, this is just a diagram uh, showing how that we have that rod with the light at the very end. It allows us to go and look um, where we're operating deep uh, in the skull. So moving on to meningiomas. So meningiomas uh, typically uh, affect females more frequently than males, about three times as common in, in females. 95% of them are slow growing. There are about 5% five, five of meningiomas that are very aggressive, that grow quicker, and that can invade structures, uh, and that are more difficult to treat. 
Um, and the symptoms and signs are related to the location. So here's just a, a meningioma, again, of the skull base in the middle cranial fossa. This is just an image of an MRI image looking face on at, at a patient. Uh, and these tumors uh, can present at varying sizes and varying locations. So this is just a summary of all the different locations in the skull base that you can see. Yes? These tumors have uh, estrogen receptors on the surface. So we think that the, the um, hormones in, in, in females are, is uh, driving some of the growth. Um, and that's why they're more common in, in women. Um, but that's only a theory. No one's actually proven that. We do know that they, they do express these hormone receptors, though. And we do know that these tumors do grow in pregnancy. Um, although the, the data for whether um, hormone replacement therapy or taking um, you know, estrogen uh, or progesterone, um, the data whether that actually stimulates the growth is, is not there yet. Uh, doesn't seem to, to, to stimulate the growth. But we do see growth during pregnancy in, in patients that are just watching their tumors. We um, form them to keep an eye out for any symptoms that may suggest a growth of their tumor during pregnancy. Yeah. Um, surgical removal, removal of uh, meningiomas uh, is dependent on the location and there are varying uh, strategies to, to approach these tumors. Um, most of the time, the, the technique involves taking down parts of bone and then reconstructing or replacing that, that, that bone. Um, and these tumors can grow to very large sizes. Uh, in fact, last week we did tumors up to 8 centimeters in size. And uh, they can present quite a, in a delayed fashion. And these tumors we know grow very slowly. So when we see a tumor that's you know, 5 centimeters, 7 centimeters, we know that it's been there a long time. So the brain accommodates, and it's incredible how much the brain can, can accommodate. Um, but at, as uh, Kelly mentioned, eventually you reach a tipping point where the pressure inside the skull is high enough that it's, it, the patients start to show symptoms. Um, the, if the tumor is not accessible, we do have other options, uh, including uh, radiation. Uh, and we know that radiation therapy is effective in these tumors. The interesting aspect of it is that I mentioned earlier is that radiation can cause these tumors, um, but we can also use radiation to treat these tumors. So it's a bit of a dichotomy there, but uh, we know that focused radiation or that high dose radiation can be used to control these tumors that are small to medium in size and uh, to get control of the growth in about 91% of patients at 10 years. Uh, for tumors that are in the skull base, they often present in an irregular shape, and they're often, as I mentioned, larger in size, uh, larger than about three centimeter. And in that situation, we can use uh, this in what's called intensity modul modulated radiation therapy, which allows us to target these larger, irregularly shaped tumors with a control rate of, uh, again, around 90, 90%, 93.6% at 4.4 years follow-up. The uh, outcomes really are dependent on the location of the tumor, so it's very personalized and, and individual. Um, but we do know that patients who sustain injury to their lower cranial nerves um, as a result of the treatment or as a result of the tumor uh, getting larger in, in size um, report lower quality of life uh, overall. Because usually these um, tumors, if they do affect cranial nerves, will affect the, your daily function, like swallowing, um, chewing, um, you may have significant pain related to it so that it affects your ability to do other things in, in life. We know that younger patients actually take longer to recover um, despite successful surgery. Um, so that's kind of a mis misunderstanding that older patients will, will do worse, but for, usually for the, for the, in general, for surgery, that, that's the case. Uh, but for these skull-based tumors, younger patients tend to uh, take longer to recover from, uh, from their illness. Yeah. Um, so that's a good that's a good question. I would so I would say under under fifty. Um, but it again it's it's more of a qualitative measure. Um, and I think that the, so the reason that these studies that are looking at quality of life are finding that younger patients are more affected is that younger patients are really more active and want, want to do 
more, right, or are looking for more out of their, their surgery. And they may not be prepared to um, deal with some of the consequences of, of the surgery, such as pain or um, having their activities limited um, compared to older um, patients. And finally, the, another important aspect is that uh, about 14 to 35 percent of patients are not able to return to the previous uh, job or, or, or working ability uh, after meningioma surgery. That's, that's right, yeah. So the primary treatment for meningioma is surgery. Uh, when it becomes symptomatic, uh, one of the options is just watching and seeing if it grows. Um, these tumors may have variable growth and they may grow very slowly, as I mentioned. Um, but ultimately, the, the principal treatment is surgery. Uh, it, the, those tumors that um, cannot be taken out surgically because they're involving these important cranial nerve structures can be radiated up front uh, and treated that way. And there's, as I mentioned, very good tumor control rates with upfront radiation for these deep seated tumors. So, on recurrence, the Again, the primary option would be surgery now. Um, if it's in an area where it would be difficult to go back in or things are stuck because of the inflammation scarring from the initial surgery, then we would consider doing radiation on, on recurrence. Um, or even if a small amount of tumor is left behind at the time of surgery, if that shows some growth, we may consider doing radiation for that. Um, so that we don't have to go back in again. That's a good question. They te they tend to recur in the same location. Yeah. Uh, there are some uh, meningioma familial syndromes um, where patients are susceptible to developing meningiomas and they'll have multiple meningiomas at different locations where they can have uh, development of new meningiomas at different uh, spots. But for the large majority of meningiomas, they, they'll, they'll recur at adjacent to the surgical site or quite at the surgical site. Uh, so for chordomas, uh, these are very rare tumors, and is that, does anyone here have a family member affected by chordoma? No. no. Okay. So I'll, I'll be very brief about this, and maybe I can talk to, uh, about uh, the stereoschordomas a little bit more because I know some in the audience had questions with about that. But chordomas are very rare tumors. They um, some cases are familial, so they can be inherited. Um, they originate in one of the bones in the, the base of the skull called the clivus. Uh, and the common symptoms are headache uh, and double vision. The most common sign is inward deviation of the eyes because of an effect on the sixth cranial nerve. Uh, and these tumors grow slowly but are invasive and they can spread. Uh, unlike other types of tumors like meningioma that doesn't spread to outside the skull base, it can spread to other parts of the body like the skin or the lungs. Uh, the, the treatment for chordoma is primarily surgery, uh, and there's been good prolonged su survival with surgical resection. Uh, and following surgery, these patients typically undergo radiation uh, aimed at the residual tumor. And the reason there's usually residual tumor in these patients is that um, it's very difficult to take out the tumor right around all these important cranial nerves. And so we try to st strike a balance between causing a cranial nerve deficit uh, and taking as much tumor out as possible. Radiation is useful for that remaining tumor and the five-year control rates are actually quite good, um, reporting up to 80% control rate at five years. There's no chemotherapy available for this tumor at the present time and all the chemotherapy that has been tried hasn't been successful to date. Uh, 
Um, so there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. Um, this is actually quite true for a lot of the skull-based tumors, so chondrosarcoma as well. Uh, we don't have chemotherapy. Vestibular schwannomas, we don't have very effective chemotherapy, um, although there are some trials uh, for new um, what are called EGFR inhibitors for uh, vestibular schwannoma that is unresponsive to surgery or radiation. Um, and for meningiomas, we don't have any chemotherapy. And in the past, hydroxyurea has been tried uh, for meningiomas, but that in mo the most recent trials hasn't been shown to be effective. So there's still a lot of research that needs to get be done um, compared to other types of uh, brain tumors that we do have a chemotherapy option. We don't have that for the majority of skull-based tumors. In terms of outcomes, 89% of patients with chordoma undergo surgery. Half of them receive radiation. Uh, and that's just dependent on how much tumor is left and whether it's uh, continuing to grow. Patients who do uh, undergo surgery survive twice as long as those patients who don't. Uh, and smaller tumor size, younger age of the patient, and treatment at a high volume center that sees a lot of patients with chordoma um, seems to be associated with longer survival. And that makes sense because, you know, if you're more uh, comfortable, you've seen a lot of patients, you understand what the, what the issues are, uh, you can treat uh, things better in that situation. Uh, finally, the effects on quality of life, and I, I think this uh, study that, that we did, um, you know, really reflects also um, other uh, patients with um, skull-based tumors in the, in the similar location, so in the clivus or around the cella. Um, essentially, um, tumors in this location can cause uh, a lot of pain, a lot of dysfunction of the cranial nerves and, and the lower cranial nerves, as well as compression of the brainstem. And we know that in these patients, the quality of life compared to normal patients is re normal people um, is reduced, and that's what the graph uh, on the left side shows here. Um, so that's a comparison of the physical and mental quality of life uh, status in these patients uh, compared to just the general population. And then what we did is we compared it to um, the quality of life of patients with other types of tumors, so low-grade gliomas, um, patients with oral cancer. Uh, as well as patients with other neurological deficits like spinal cord injury or stroke. And you can see that the effects of a neurological deficit really cause a, a decline in a quality of life. For example, most patients with stroke or spinal cord injury and patients with skull-based chordoma are in the middle um, between those with low grade and uh, glioma and those with a stroke or spinal cord injury. Uh, so we do know that uh, there is an, uh, an effect on quality of life, and this is in patients that have undergone surgery and, and radiation treatment. And the major factors that contribute to this decline in quality of life is pain and uh, control of pain in these patients. It's something that's very important for us to, to recognize and, and to deal with, um, as well as use of steroid medication. So we heard about all the um, problems that can happen with, with steroids, and. Um, that's certainly something to keep in mind when we're, we're prescribing and um, the, the length of steroid uh, medication. Uh, and finally, neurological deficits such as problems with bowel bladder function or, problem, or loss of sensation. Um, the other important factors that we found in, in that study was that uh, patients who smoke tend to have a worse quality of life, um, as well as patients who had um, depression or low mood. Um, tended to have a worse quality of life. So it's important to treat the whole patient and make sure that we control other risk factors that may be contributing. Um, so finally, uh, skull-based tumors are rare. Um, and I'd like to thank again the Brain Tumor Foundation for letting me talk about these tumors that are often not at the forefront of uh, human family physician awareness or general um, uh, awareness. And uh, the symptoms can be varied, as I mentioned, and depend on the tumor location. The treatment is primarily surgical, uh, and very few chemotherapy options is, exist, so there's a lot of room for re further research in this field. And uh, due to the constraints of the skull and surrounding brain structures, surgical resection is often uh, not complete. Uh, and that's why, I, although we call these tumors benign, um, they may not have a benign clinical course overall. Thank you for uh, your time and attention to me.